Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brent Halpern. I am the Scientific Director for the AI Horizons Network, and this is our second AI Horizons Network seminar. Uh, today we have uh, Pin Yu Chen from IBM Research. He's going to be talking about uh, recent progress in adversarial robustness of AI models, which is an extension of his NeurIPS paper from 2018. Um, Pin Yu's uh, an RSM, a research staff member at IBM Research uh, in uh, New York um, or Cambridge, probably Cambridge, sorry. Um, I've been research AI um, and working with the MIT IBM Watson AI lab projects and uh, expertise in uh, data mining, machine learning, signal processing, cyber security. Uh, the general format is we'll have uh, everybody muted and uh, Ping Yu will give his talk and then we'll open the um, the uh, the conversation for questions. Also. If you want to unmute yourself and ask your questions, there's a chat channel. Um, the chat is a little speech bubble icon at the bottom when you mouse over the bottom of your screen. Uh, so with no further ado, can you uh, please go ahead? Okay. Yeah. So Brent, can you hear me all right? You are fine. Okay. Yeah. So hi everyone. Um, nice meeting you. Uh, I'm Pinyu Chen, uh, and thanks, Brent, for the nice introduction and for the invitation. Um, so I'm a research staff member based in Yorktown in uh, New York. Uh, so today I'm going to walk you through uh, our recent uh, works on the area of adversarial robustness. So this will, as uh, Brent mentioned, this will be an extended version of our certification work uh, published at the New Ribs last year. But in order to uh, help uh, you help us motivate what the uh, uh, robustness certification is about. Uh, I, uh, we, I will have a small detour to walk you through attacks and defenses and spend the last half of the, the section on robustness certification. Okay, so let's uh, start with something fun. So if I were to give you this label and ask you to provide a label for this image, uh, what uh, would the people usually provide? Um, so most likely you will say this is the ostrich. And this is also what AI says. It is an ostrich by AI model, uh, identified by AI model as well. Um, but the interesting thing is about this image. So what would this image uh, be labeled, right? So human will probably say, hey, it's also an ostrich. But the interesting thing is now AI says it's a shoe shop. Um, and this is not a coincidence. So it turns out like these AI models can be easily fooled uh, by this uh, so-called adversarial image. So you can not only uh, turn the label of the ostrich to a uh, shoe shop, it can be turned into safe or vacuum or whatever label you want. And the AI model we are talking about is not some random and crappy AI model. This is actually the best image classifiers using neural networks that we are using uh, nowadays. And one thing I would like to highlight is that images and neural network models are not the only victims to this uh, adversarial inputs. Uh, we are interested in images because it's uh, easily to be visualized, and we are interested in neural networks because they are the state-of-the-art models for this task, for example, object detection. Uh, if you are working on other domains, uh, you can certainly take other models uh, to, to, uh, into consideration and study their adversarial robustness. So uh, these uh, images, as I mentioned, is called the adversarial example. So these are like uh, um, prediction evasive samples that can, are being created at test time. Like you have already a trained neural network model and you want to find adversarial um, perturbations to that input such that the prediction of that model will go wrong. But the adversarial input are still look uh, like as the original input. And uh, as some of you might know, I'm a big superhero fan. So there is always an episode in this uh, super, uh, he, uh, superhero movie where you know you have a to uh, characters that look totally the same, but one is like uh, benign, one is uh, evil, and then they look, look totally the same, but they have different characteristics. So I think this is a perfect uh, analogy for adversarial examples. They look totally alike as a benign input, but uh, their prediction and their output will be totally different, and they will have different functionalities. So why do we care about adversarial examples? So as I mentioned, this uh, adversarial robustness is a, is a big, big umbrella, and you can think about this robustness from different angles. For example, in addition to adversarial robustness, people also care about um, 
uh, robustness of the training data. For example, if your adversary can have access to your training data and embed some backdoor to your training data such that the model you train on this poison data could be uh, affected, then uh, it is also a, 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 a type of adversarial attack that we call the poisoning attack. But here we are more interested uh, in this talk, we are more interested in adversarial examples, which is the attack that is being deployed at test time. You don't have access to the training data. And instead, we have uh, we are facing a trend uh, AI model at test time, and you are what you want to create some prediction evasive adversarial inputs uh, to that training data. And this is the typical scenario where we deploy AI models, uh, machine learning models, uh, uh, systems as a service, right? So like a Google Cloud service, like IBM services, and so on. And whether uh, and and we are now asking whether you can find the vulnerabilities of these deploy systems. Uh, and by the way, uh, let me know if you have any questions and just unmute yourself and uh, let me know uh, by any time. So why do we care about these adversarial examples? So uh, there are several reasons we have to deal with it carefully. The first thing is uh, there is a crisis in trust. So uh, like general audience seems to be very concerned if any inconsistent decision making between AI and machine learning models will uh, exist. So this is, for example, a typical example is, uh, is it possible to uh, manipulate a stop sign by adding some adversarial stickers such that uh, your autonomous driving car, when it sees this uh, perturbed uh, stop sign, it will think it's a speed limit, and hence it wouldn't stop and causing some security related tests, uh, security related uh, issues. Uh, if you are a machine learning researcher, you are very, we are very interested in knowing why uh, these machine learning models are so, so vulnerable to these small perturbations happen, happening at the input space. So, uh, and because this somehow indicates there is a limitation in our current, current machine learning uh, systems and how we train these uh, uh, machine learning models to, to, to do their jobs. And lastly, in terms of uh, company or, <coughs> or public awareness, uh, there is always a concern about loss in revenue and reputation. Uh, for example, just like two weeks, two weeks ago, you might find some articles saying Tesla's autopilot uh, system can be easily fooled by just uh, adding some small stickers on the road sign and uh, the autopilot system will, uh, will direct you to a different route that is supposed not to do that. And like recently, um, like uh, last year, uh, some Google online service accidentally tagged uh, African-Americans as gorillas and, and kind of uh, uh, arise some discussions and, have, uh, and leads to some revenue and reputation loss for these uh, AI-based services. Um, but we know as a fact that uh, these things could happen either by the bias of the data or it can be manipulated by these so-called adversarial examples. So if the general audience didn't know uh, this technique ex exists and didn't, uh, didn't know how easy we can manipulate the output of our AI model, then we can certainly create these uh, adversarial images and causing some revenue or reputation loss or distrust among uh, humans and machines. That's, that's something we uh, want to certainly want to avoid. So as I mentioned, that this is what IBM's strategy is, and that's why we are very dedicated to this trusty AI. So trusty AI is our company strategy. And among trusty AI, there are different pillars, including robustness, uh, things that we just talked about, not just for adversarial examples, but also training time attacks, model stealing, and so on. And we also care about fairness. How do we make sure the uh, prediction, the decisions made by models are fair and, and and justifiable. And we also care about explainability. How did you explain AI's models uh, uh, the decision? Why, why you think this is ostrich and why it is not some other labels? And we also care about accountability to make the AI models transparent. So this is the big uh, umbrella un um, under trusty AI and robustness is something we are going to zoom in. And, we are, and then we are going to have a deep dive to these uh, certification methods. Um, so I would like to show uh, our portfolio in the research of adversarial robustness uh, research. So this is apparently not an in inclusive list. So I'm only uh, highlighting the researches that I'm involved in. So uh, if you count IBM, the uh, whole IBM team, we have like probably double number of uh, papers uh, or um, uh, technical reports uh, working on this field. And I'm also focusing on adversarial examples on this slide. Uh, but uh, I would like to mention we have done a lot of amazing works in other type of adversarial attacks as well. For example, to detect a poisoning attack, like training time attacks. Uh, the, the team at the um, IBM Alma, the research lab, actually won the best paper award at the Safe AI this year. 
So we certainly have a lot of visibility here. Um, and in terms of research, we have uh, published uh, more than 15 papers on this topic of adversarial robustness. So we are certainly one of the, one of the most active, and I, I would say, a leading group in, in this field. And we cover a lot of different topics, including attacks, defenses, robustness certification evaluation, um, connections to interpretability and robustness accuracy trade-off, and also some zeroth order optimization techniques to make this a uh, uh, vulnerability analysis uh, easier. And our research certainly have a lot of attention from the uh, general public as well. So uh, media will, will cover our research because this is not an uh, interest, not just to our research community, but uh, to a general public as well, because uh, AI models one day they are going to be you know, coexist with human being widely deployed to our daily lives. So uh, this, this kind of research is very important, not to researchers, but also to general audience. And we also, um, have, uh, IBM has an open source toolbox called Adversal Robustness Toolbox, where we release our uh, public, uh, our our uh, publications and codes uh, to help people do this research in adversarial robustness research. Um, so here is the roadmap of uh, making AI or machine learning model trustworthy. And as I mentioned, there are uh, many topics uh, under adversarial robustness. So they are attacks, uh, how you find the vulnerability of your AI models. They are defenses, how do you uh, improve the robustness of your AI model and also detect adversarial inputs. How and certification evaluation, basically how did you certify uh, your model and your input is uh, robust or not? And how did you uh, provide a formal evaluation of the robustness of your AI model? And there's always the interpretability angle of adversarial examples because uh, eventually, um, the, the existence of adversarial example can be um, explained by lacking interpretability of our AI systems. And uh, for example, uh, my colleague CJ Liu is an expert in this field. Um, there are a lot of research skill uh, sets and tools that can, uh, that can be used to, to study adversarial robustness, including a lot of optimization techniques, uh, robust optimization, high dimensional statistics, and of course, deep learning. So uh, when I uh, working on this adversarial robustness, I like to think of uh, this research as a magic mirror. So basically, every researcher will see some part of it uh, in, in when you are looking at the papers on adversarial robustness because in, uh, it is a very young and exciting field, and it's a very inclusive uh, field in the sense that uh, every model we are working on, every task we are working on, we must have a model to execute these tasks. And whether this model is robust to these adversarial attempts, uh, is of our interest. So basically, adversarial robustness research is everywhere and is very comprehensive. Um, so one thing that we discovered at first place, and, and it, it is uh, honestly quite shocking for us, is that uh, accuracy uh, is, does, not, does not imply adversarial robustness. So if you are familiar with the research of deep learning, you might know this uh, very well-known competition called ImageNet. So basically, ImageNet is where people submit models to predict uh, object uh, detections and then basically rank each model's performance in terms of their um, test error or test accuracy. Um, so for, for the past few years, the only goal to, to benchmark each model's performance is uh, the, the standard test accuracy. Um, so uh, out of uh, curiosity, we actually take uh, 18 different ImageNet models submitted over time. Um, and they have a different accuracy. And then we uh, kind of rank them in terms of robustness. So uh, the X axis is the different models accuracy and Y axis is the robustness. So you can think of the robustness uh, that we are showing here is uh, a measure of how easy it is to uh, manipulate the input to generate adversarial examples. And somehow to our surprise, we found that the more accurate models is actually um, less robust to adversarial examples. And this can be somehow explained uh, by, in a sense that by, in order to achieving high accuracy, you uh, more or less need to uh, overfit uh, the decision boundaries a bit and make a decision boundary non-smooth. And somehow this non-smoothness will cause uh, adversarial examples to exist. So that's why we call it a robustness accuracy trade-off. And this also indicates um, in order to make this AI model trustworthy, Accuracy is not the only metric. We should only we should also care about robustness because uh, if you solely pursuing a high accurate model, it usually wouldn't come with robustness. Um, 
So as I mentioned, why do researchers and society care about adversarial robustness? So overall, this is all about trust uh, because AI models and AI services services are going to penetrate our daily lives in no time. And but uh, what's been discovered in this research of adversarial robustness is whenever there is a neural network model, there is actually a way to generate these adversarial examples. So I'm showing you, you other uh, possible applications of generating adversarial examples. For example, this is the image captioning test uh, attack that we have shown in the past. Uh, so basically, this image will generate correct uh, and related uh, uh, captions. For example, a red, a red stop sign sitting on the side of a road. But again, if you use our technique and you add some small perturbation to create adversarial examples in the bottom, uh, you can manipulate the outcome and having some uh, like a crazy captions like a brown teddy bear lying laying on top of a bed, and these two images are basically look the same to human, and you can do the same thing for uh, automatic speech recognition systems where which we will revisit uh, in a few slides. Uh, and these things didn't, did not just happen in digital world. In physical world, these things could happen as well. So uh, CMU researchers have uh, devised some uh, adversarial glasses. Well, so once you wear that adversarial glasses, your face recognition system will think you are someone else rather than the person wearing the glass. Uh, you can apply this technique to uh, evaluate the robust, uh, robustness of uh, autonom autonomous driving systems for sure. And you can create these 3D adversarial objects, in this case, a 3D adversarial turtles. And if you take uh, your cell phone and, and take a picture from different angles, for most of the time, uh, your mach machines wouldn't realize it is an adversarial turtle and you will think it is a rifle or something else. So uh, this adversarial robustness is not just happening in digital world. In physical world, people have been finding ways to make these things happen. And you, so you can imagine if our lives uh, truly depends on these adversarial uh, AI models um, to do jobs for us. There is a trust crisis that we need to resolve. Okay, so next I'm going to show you, walk you through some uh, adversarial attacks that have been developed uh, in the past. So how do we actually generate these adversarial examples? So uh, researchers actually start from a white box approach. So white box means uh, everything is transparent to the, uh, the adversary when you try to generate these adversarial examples, including how your model's uh, architecture is, how your model is trained, um, how many, uh, so basically there is no secret to hide from an adversary. Um, so here, this is an example of uh, showing you how do we generate a adversarial uh, example of a French bulldog. So if you put, uh, if you input this original image, uh, French bulldog, your neural network classifier will say it's a French bulldog with 90% uh, accuracy. But what if now I want to generate uh, some perturbations to the input such that it will be classified as, uh, let's say, basketball? So what people do uh, is actually very easy. It's uh, relying on the back propagation. Uh, uh, of, of this uh, neural network you are going to attack. So the way we do is in order to, to generate this adversarial perturbation, we ask neural network to, to give us some directions to increase the confidence of being classified as a basketball and also decrease the confidence of being classified as a French bulldog. And we also want to make sure the perturbations are small such that uh, uh, the final adversarial image will look the same as the original image. And as you can imagine, this technique is very general and does, does not limit it to uh, image classification alone. So basically different applications relying on neural network because you have this uh, uh, function of backpropagation, you can do these adversarial examples very easily uh, in the white box setting. So here is more like a mathematical definition of how people generate uh, adversarial attacks or more specifically adversarial perturbations. So first we have to define something that we call threat model, like what is the allowed perturbation um, to, to your input. So we have a perturbation delta confined to some distance metric or some semantic space uh, relative to a given input x, x0. So semantic space, you can think of these uh, uh, semantic perturbations uh, happening on x0 as well, for example, rotation, translation, uh, change, change the lightning and so on. And so the general attack formulation is we try to minimize the, the distance, uh, basically preserve the similarity between the original image X naught and the, the uh, perturbed image X naught plus delta. 
uh, while ensuring the prediction of the neural network model of X0 and X0 plus tilde are different. So this is a typical setting for the untargeted attack where you want to find the delta that make uh, the final prediction went wrong, but you don't specify uh, which target you desire. And it's very easy to change uh, your untargeted, untargeted attack formulation to untargeted attack formulation where you want your prediction of the perturbed image to be a specific label. Uh, and there are several alternatives of this attack formulation. You can do uh, minimize the distance plus some uh, attack loss function. But basically, it's a, loss, a surrogate loss function of the condition that the two predictions on the original image and the perturbed image has to be different. Or you can do uh, minimize the uh, attack loss function uh, subject to the some uh, con uh, distance as a constraint. So you want to make sure the uh, distance between the uh, original image and the perturbed image are smaller than some epsilon uh, distance. And here are some commonly used distance in the literature. So we start from the uh, most easy and uh, mathematically well-defined uh, no, um, distance, for example, the LP non ball centered on X0. So in this case, the distance of uh, between X0 and X0 plus delta really boils down to the norms of the deltas. And you can, usually people consider different norm, LP norms, for example, L, L infinity norm of uh, delta basically means what the maximum perturbation allowed in each input dimension. Uh, L, L2 norms are basically the sum of square differences of each, each in, input dimension. And L1 norms are their total variation. And L0 norms are the number of modified dimensions. How many, for example, how many pixels you, you will going to be modified. And more recently, our recent work have uh, really pushed the limit of this uh, attack by considering mixed norms and structure attack that uh, fake focus on uh, convolutional filters and so on. So we can generate a clean and interpretable perturbations. And that's how we uh, can build connection to interpretability as well. And for the loss function, um, uh, attack loss function, usually people use cross entropy or contrastive loss. So contrastive loss is something I ex explained in a few slides ago. For example, in order to make this Bego image uh, to be classified as a grand piano after adding this noise, uh, you, will, you will try to increase the confidence of the grand piano and also try to decrease the confidence of uh, the Bego label. Uh, that's how uh, people generate adversarial examples uh, in a mathematical um, formulation. Um, but you may argue, so, so so far we are talking about is in the white box attack sense where you have access to your model and you, you can do bug propagation. But what if uh, in a practical setting when you deploy your machine learning model as a service, there is no way I tell you what my model is behind the service. Uh, so this is in the, actually a setting of the AI or machine learning systems with limited access. And that's what we call a black box setting. So there was a time people believe uh, this black box setting is actually robust to these adversarial perturbations because now you are not able to do back propagation and hence my model should be secured. Um, but uh, our, our recent work shows this is actually not the case. Um, so it turns out that even without doing back propagation, we can still generate these adversarial examples. And um, so our, our work uh, published in um, 2017 is actually the first work uh, that try to make this uh, attack more practical in a black box setting. So the way we did it is uh, we tried in, uh, instead of uh, doing back propagation, which is not in, which is infeasible in this setting, we are actually trying to estimate the gradient uh, instead of doing actual back propagation. And such that uh, using this estimated gradient, we can generate these adversarial perturbations and make a French bulldog being classified as a basketball or so, or making a bagel classified as a green piano. And this uh, grading estimation is nothing but some finite difference method uh, that we have learned in, in high school or in, in uh, calculus. And more recently, in 2019, we have uh, improved the version of this uh, black box attack. So uh, our, our previous method is great, but it usually needs a lot of queries to make this uh, attack feasible. So for example, to make the bagel being classified as a grand piano, we usually need a million of queries from the machine learning model. Um, so what we are proposing here is actually a more query efficient way of doing this. So we actually apply dimension reduction to, um, uh, to, to make the number of queries more efficient. And we also have a, a newer a gradient estimation technique uh, to, make, to reduce the number of queries we need to find adversarial perturbations. So if you compare the first row and the second row, 
uh, of these methods, you can you can see that uh, we 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 uh, the new method auto zoom reduces more than 80% of the queries while still giving you a similar adversarial images at the end. So this uh, auto zoom is actually is uh, uh, making this uh, black box attack or uh, the way we call it is an efficient way of estimate uh, evaluating the robustness of uh, AI systems with with limited access plausible. Um, here are some other more examples of how we how this auto zoom works on ImageNet. So basically, image uh, auto zoom can save millions of, of queries uh, when compared to our first attack, the zoo attack. And what it's actually doing is is using a few queries to find successful perturbations, and then uh, using more queries to refine the perturbation such that uh, the final image will be similar to the original image, but still having uh, this uh, adversarial effect. Um, so now you may ask, so what we have discussed so far, we are actually assuming we know the confidence score of the AI model from a black box system in order to generate this adversarial example. Then, is, then the next question is, is it possible to generate these adversarial uh, examples if I only give you the top one prediction of the model and I didn't give you how confident I am uh, for, the, for the input? Uh, the turns out the, an the answer is yes. So in our recent uh, ICLR uh, paper, we showed that uh, even if you are giving me the label, uh, the top one prediction, which is the least possible uh, information you should, you should be given to any regular user, it is still possible to generate these adversarial inputs. So in, for example, in this case, uh, we have a snack, uh, snake image um, as the original input, and we want to, it to be classified as a cat. So we, we, what we are doing is we start from a cat image and, and gradually uh, fine tune our, our perturbation such that uh, this image uh, will be similar to the original image, but it will be classified as a cat. And we can do it in a very query efficient way as well. Um, so as I uh, alluded before, uh, adversarial attacks are not only occurring in images, and it can occur in other, uh, and not only limited to convolution neural nets. So like recurrent neural nets can be uh, vulnerable as well. And other tasks, for example, image plus text, the image captioning could be vulnerable to um, these adversarial attacks as well. Uh, if you follow the general principle of uh, doing back propagation and specifying how, how you are going to attack your model and speci specifying your threat model. So I would argue this is a more or less a, um, universal uh, threat or a universal concern to machine learning researchers. No matter what they have said you are using, what model you are using, um, there is an adversarial robustness angle that you should consider uh, how reliable your model is to this uh, type of adversarial inputs. Um, next, I'm moving to adversarial defenses. So compared to attacks, um, defenses are actually uh, less well developed because the, it's actually a more challenging task than uh, doing an attack because what attack is doing is uh, finding one adversarial input that breaks the prediction. But for defense, you basically need to find, uh, you, you basically need to defend all possible adversarial inputs. So this is really a worst case scenario and that's why making this uh, defense a very challenging task. Uh, and there are a, a lot of reasons why uh, learning a robust model is challenging, for example, uh, we usually don't have an uh, interpretability of what our mo AI model makes decision. And our training data could be noisy and biased. Um, and also, uh, when we design these AI models, these uh, neural networks, we really don't have the notion of uh, security or privacy or uh, robustness in mind. So the current architecture that we are uh, training on could be uh, vulnerable um, to these adversarial inputs. And finally, this uh, attack and defenses, uh, they can both leverage these AI techniques we build on and try to you know, improve upon each other. So for example, uh, if you look at the history of this adversarial research, um, you, will, you will find a trend that people propose some defenses and a few weeks or a few months later, um, uh, other, other researchers find a way to bypass uh, these existing defenses and, and claim them, uh, these defenses to be ineffective. Uh, so there is a really an arm race between attacks and defenses, and uh, more or less this is what makes uh, this research a lot of fun. So where we are in terms of this adversarial defense. So um, first, the way we evaluate defense is actually we are allowing the defender to move first. It, that means uh, a defense is robust only when it is known to an adversary but still cannot break it. So defender has to make the first move to make your model robust. and 
attacker uh, makes the latter move where it sees how how the defender is doing and try to see if there's a way to bypass the the, the defense mechanisms that you apply on your model. Um, so there are several attempts uh, for defenses, for example, data augmentation, try, try to augment with adversarial examples to improve the, uh, to retrain your model. So it helps, but not, uh, did not truly solve the problem. And there are ways to improve the model robustness, for example, by changing the conventional model training from minimization to uh, minimax min training. Basically, uh, it's called a robust training. So uh, in addition to train the uh, model parameters, in the meantime, we are also generating these adversarial inputs and giving them the same, the correct labels and ask your model to re memorize these adversarial inputs somehow and correct them so you can learn a more robust model. So this approach is effective, but uh, we also find it to be not scalable. And because of this um, minimax worst case uh, training scenario, you, we often you, you are suffering from a, a significant drop in your test accuracy compared to conventional training. Um, there are other ways like uh, doing input transformation, doing correction, uh, rect rect uh, rectification, anomaly detection, but many of the defenses are bypassed by uh, advanced attacks. Um, so people have been also looking at other ways. So the one direction that we believe are more promising is actually using the diverse models, including model ensembles and model with randomness uh, to basically increase the cost of uh, adversarial attacks. Um, and uh, uh, later on, I will show some domain specific uh, defenses where we have some promising results, but uh, one downside is these domain specific tasks. They, uh, these uh, defense rules cannot be easily generalized to other domains. Um, so here is a case study of how we try to de uh, detect this audio adversarial samples. So audio adversarial samples is again, you add some small perturbation to your input audio file and it could uh, alter the transcribed results of your audio system. Um, so the way we, we detect these audio adversarial examples is really leveraging the temporal dependency nature of the audio, uh, um, audio speech recognition system. And to find the, the discrepancy between um, benign and adversarial inputs. So the way we did it is uh, we first pass the whole uh, audio input um, to the system and we obtain a, a corresponding sentence. Then we try to chop off uh, the input sequence and only, and only pass the chopped version of the sequence to the, to the system, pass it through the system again. Then we compare the uh, counterpart of this, uh, the whole sequence and the chopped sequence. So if you are a benign, uh, if you are a benign uh, audio, then your chop sequence and the whole sequence will uh, more or less be similar in terms of this uh, word error rate or um, um, character error rate. But if you are adversarial input, because your nature is to change the transcribed output, then we we can expect that um, the word error, word error rate uh, of the chopped sentence and the whole sentence will be uh, significantly different. And we can actually use this uh, uh, error rate as a, uh, um, as a statistic to distinguish benign adversarial inputs. And this heuristic actually turns out to be very effective. And this is because we know how this uh, uh, auto uh, automatic speech recognition system works. And somehow we are leveraging domain knowledge of uh, temporal dependency to, to build uh, a detector and hence improve the robustness of uh, the entire AI system. So um, robustness and improving, uh, um, uh, improving robustness and detecting adversarial inputs are certainly possible. But uh, in this case, we are really relying on some domain specific knowledge. Uh, and, and therefore, and one interesting question is how do we generalize this notion and kind of uh, creating an automatic way of uh, finding um, these domain specific knowledge for different tasks in the automated fashion. That would be a very interesting direction to go. Okay, so finally, we are looking at the robustness and certification and evaluation. So the reason I motivate attack and defenses first is um, there are several ways to evaluate the robustness of your AI model. So uh, one very typical way is people usually use a game-based approach where you specify uh, a set of players. In this case, uh, I, I can call a different attack function and different defenses and uh, operate them on my, uh, on my model and I can benchmark the performance uh, between each attacker and defender pair. Uh, so this is a very reasonable approach, but the downside is um, uh, this uh, metric or rank may be misleading and there's no guarantee that your model will be robust to the attacks that you didn't perform on. So there's a, 
a concern of not being able to generalize uh, your defense or a, a robustness uh, performance to other attacks or future attacks. Uh, so that's why kind of motivate the second way of uh, evaluating robustness that is uh, we call it verification or certification. So in this case, we are not relying on attacks to, to evaluate robustness. Instead, we try to build an attack independent uh, certification for evaluating robustness. Um, so in this case, what the, uh, this uh, approach can do is to provide a certificate uh, for your model. Um, but there, the downside of this approach is that um, um, the optimal verification is very difficult, especially for large neural networks. And uh, I, I will um, go deep, do a deep dive in a few slides later. So um, geometrically, how do we understand how this verification works? And uh, what does it, it mean uh, in terms of these adversarial examples? So uh, geometrically, if you think of these uh, dashed lines as the decision boundaries learned from a neural network classifier, so if your input is in the middle region, you will say it's ostrich here, and and if you go across the decision boundary, it will be classified as other labels. So the way we define robustness, uh, the attacks is trying to push the image to the other uh, decision boundary other uh, to go across the decision boundary so so it will be misclassified uh, as something else but uh, trying to keep the distance between the red line and red point and the black point small so they will look visually the same so attacks in this case is actually an upper bound on the minimum perturbation so here we define the minimum perturbation as the smallest distance required to alter the decision of the, uh, the input sequence so in this case, uh, any, uh, the perturbation given by any attack, successful attack, is actually an upper bound of the minimum perturbation. And on the contrary, um, the robustness certification is actually the lower bound of the minimum perturbation. So uh, ev eventually, we want to find the minimum perturbation of the, uh, any given input, but that problem has to be has, has already been proven to be NP hard. So instead, we try to find an efficient way of computing a lower bound of the minimum perturbation. And we can provide a certificate saying, no matter how you perturb your image within this uh, epsilon, uh, within this uh, um, green ball, your top one prediction will be the same, which means your model will be consistent. Uh, the, the top one prediction of your model will be consistent, no matter how you move your point in this green ball. So that's how the certification well, we are going to give uh, for the remaining slides. So here is the overview of uh, what's uh, been developed uh, in the past few years. So uh, we have done a series of works uh, along the line of robustness certification and evaluation, um, including the Kleber and Fastlim and Crown and CNN cert. So these are like different versions of, of our robustness certification works and it can support. So we are trying to make the functions more general and support different network models. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go, then go ahead to explain what we are doing for, uh, for this line of work. So basically, when we are trying to certify um, a neural network model, you need to first give, give a trained neural network model, and then second, uh, given a data input. So because uh, different data input will have different minimum distortion, some may close, be close to the decision boundary, some may be further away. So um, this uh, robustness certification is given in the input sample level instead of a model level. And then we can specify a threat model that we want to certify, for example, the LP norms between the perturbed uh, image X and the original image X naught. So what we are asking is if we, you are allowed to uh, modify the, uh, the image X naught by adding some perturbation within this epsilon ball, will, will the top one prediction uh, of the perturbed image be altered? So in this case, is it possible within epsilon ball uh, perturbation? Is it is po is it possible to uh, alter the label of uh, ostrich to a shoe shop or a vacuum? Um, so the way we did it is, uh, if you can, so now you are allowing your input to be plus and minus epsilon for each input dimension, and then um, basically, if you are assuming uh, your activation functions um, can provide some upper and lower bounds, assuming the upper and lower bounds are known at this moment, so. Uh, you can have you can have a lowering upper bounds on each activation function, and what all we do is we kind of propagate this uh, activation function, the bounds of the activation function, layer by layer. So after layers of layers operation, we can reach 
uh, the upper and lower bounds of each class output. And then what we do is uh, we, uh, we are comparing the lower bound of the ostrich with the upper bound of all other classes. And if we can assure the lower bound of ostrich is higher than the upper bound of all other, shoes, uh, of all other classes uh, under this perturbation, epsilon perturbation, then we can guarantee there is no attack within epsilon ball perturbation that can alter the prediction of our, our model. And therefore, you can have an epsilon certificate. And then the remaining task is basically how do you uh, do a bisection on this epsilon to find the largest possible epsilon that give you this uh, type of uh, consistent uh, decision making certificate. Okay, so this, this thing is easy if we know the lower bound and upper bound of your activation function. So the next question, and that's actually the main task that our new RIPS paper is trying to solve is how do we find this uh, lower and upper bound of each activation function in a very efficient way? So you, we know uh, for a fact that the most of the activation functions uh, in neural networks, uh, they are actually nonlinear. For example, uh, hyperbolic tangent, uh, ReLU, sigmoid, and so on. So it is, uh, it is not linear in nature. But uh, in order to make our uh, certificate efficient, we actually uh, require the linear bounds on each activation, uh, on each activation uh, neuron and, uh, and over each layer. So what we end up doing is we actually linearize, try to provide linear bounds of each activation function. So in this case, for example, this is a same example of a radio function where we can provide linear upper and lower bounds of this, this radio function. And we do it for each layer, uh, each neuron in, in each layer. So if we linearize the activation bounds in each, uh, for each neuron, then um, um, end to end, we can have a linearized uh, neural network model, and we can have uh, we can propagate these bounds in a very efficient manner. So here is some uh, small theory that basically shows what we are doing here. So uh, imagine this F J F F here is your neural network classifier, and J is the J class. So if we do this uh, linear bounding techniques, what we can show is that the, the the actual output of your function uh, uh, fjx is can be upper and lower bounded by two linear functions fjl and fj u where fjl and fj u are actually uh, uh, the coefficient actually linear functions by themselves and these uh, layer coefficients are determined by these uh, propagations uh, over layers that we uh, that uh, we have shown here uh, and what we are showing here, this, this is another example of how we uh, do linearized bounds uh, for different activation functions. So in this technique, our technique, this crown can be uh, applied to different uh, general activation functions. So basically you specify activation function, then uh, crown will try to linearize uh, uh, different parts of your, um, your activation function and make sure uh, these uh, linear bounds can be efficiently computed and can be uh, propagated to, to from the input all the way to the output. Okay, so, what, so once we have that in mind, uh, basically what we are doing here is again, we are trying to uh, provide a linear bound on the, the output of a neural network model, which is known to be highly nonlinear. But providing linear bounds is actually a good balance uh, for us to efficiently do this uh, certification framework. So, for example, if we specify the epsilons and we want to say we want to know under this epsilon um, thread model, is it possible to find adversarial examples? Uh, then different methods actually uh, I have uh, different ways of doing that in, a, in, in, a, in an efficient manner. For example, the, the earliest work, FastLim, uh, assumes that the upper and lower bounds have the same parameter, and Crown uh, kind of allows different parameters for the upper and lower bounds, and also e extended to uh, general activation functions, whereas FastLim only considers radio activations. And our uh, most recent work, CNN Cert, which is published at AAA 2019, it's actually uh, some certification methods optimized for convolution neural nets. So here we are really leveraging the convolutional nature uh, of, the, uh, of, of a convolution neural network. And so we can uh, uh, represent the upper and lower bounds in terms of uh, convolution operations and make the computation more efficient. Um, so, uh, so CR insert is basically some um, a technique that we build upon Crown. So it, it includes all the benefits of Crown. So it can also uh, support uh, general activation functions, but it can also support other things that we haven't shown for Crown. For example, 
CNN cert can, pro, uh, can provide support to different various building blocks. So uh, I should have mentioned this robustness certification is a very challenging text. So whatever model you have, whatever layer you have, uh, whatever new operations you have in mind, uh, we have to ca um, catch up with, your, with the advance of this neural network architecture and provide the corresponding uh, certification techniques. So this, uh, this does not come for free, for example, uh, for, for a network model consisting of different layers, including convolution layers, special normalization layers, residual blocks, or pooling layers, we literally need to um, uh, define how do we do this, uh, how do we find linear bounds for different layers and different uh, operations such that we can do this certification in an efficient way. And so CN cert is, uh, is our latest uh, version of this uh, robustness certification tool. So it can supply not just for pure CNN, but also more advanced models like ResNet or LearnNet. Um, so he, this is the slide that we try to conclude why is the di what uh, is the difference between CNN cert and the previous works. So what CNN cert is doing is uh, it can provide general network architecture. So I would say it can support state-of-the-art machine learning architectures uh, that inc usually includes batch normalization, pooling, and residual blocks. And CNN search is uh, relatively more efficient than Crown or FastLink because CNN search is really using the convolution uh, operations on CNNs. And instead, FastLink and Crown, when we are doing, when we are developing, we usually convert them back to um, multi-layer perceptrons. So it's uh, so CNN search kind of avoids this conversion and makes things uh, computation more efficient. Um, so here is a comparison of uh, the certification bonds. So again, uh, we are testing this certification on different networks. So it's uh, uh, different layers and different activation functions, different depths, and so on. And we can consider them uh, for different LP norms. Um, so what we can show is that uh, the bounds found by CNN search is usually larger than the other like the existing methods. And it's improved uh, from some percent uh, up, up to, and can possibly go up to 20% because of the efficient techniques, efficient uh, certification techniques and general architectures that we have in mind. And it is also computationally more efficient. So because of this convolutional nature, CNN insert actually saves a lot of computation time. Okay, so lastly, the, uh, a different work from uh, certification is uh, Clever. That uh, is actually the first work we developed for evaluating robustness. So Clever is, a, again, an attack independent score. But instead of uh, providing a certificate saying no attacks can, can alter the prediction within epsilon both, it is uh, rather an a estimated, uh, estimated uh, a score. So it, it is a score rather than a certificate in the sense that uh, Clever did, did not provide a certificate, but it provides an estimate uh, of the minimum perturbation of a given input to the closest decision boundary. Um, so uh, how, do you, how did you use Clever or other certifications that we have in mind? Um, the, the best use case that we are recommending is really the before after robustness comparison. So more or less you encounter a problem if I do a certain operation in my current model, for example, add a pooling layer, um, do some pre-filtering, how much robustness can I gain, right? So, um, so to answer that question, it's actually very ideal to use Clever or, or the uh, verification techniques that we have discovered so far to do this job. So it, it provides a score or a certificate to justify how much robustness you, you, you can improve uh, by doing a certain operations. And we also use Clever in other ways, for example, to understand the accuracy, robustness, trade-off of different uh, new, uh, image connect classifiers that I have shown you before. Um, uh, within IBM, we actually uh, extensively use Clever to do these uh, interesting demos and so on. So one interesting demo we do is called the big check. So uh, what we do for Clever is we kind of uh, hypothesize three different uh, uh, banks using uh, different uh, different classifiers to do this handwritten digit recognition. And we use Clever to compute their robustness scores and ask humans to rank with, uh, to rank this uh, robustness and agreement between humans and machines. And uh, more, of, or more or less, we found out Clever score can reflect how people think uh, the robustness of the, uh, uh, this AI banking system as well. So it is a very interesting use case. And we have, uh, we have a demo on, on this uh, uh, link address. So if you're interested, uh, feel, feel free to check this out. 
So that's how Clever can be used. It can use to understand the robustness of different threat models, different data sets, different neural architectures, and or different defense mechanisms. Uh, we have open source Clever, so it's uh, being implemented in a adversarial robustness toolbox. And in, in addition to Clever, in addition to Clever, Art has, has a lot of different attacks and defenses. So it, I would say it's the most comprehensive uh, adversarial toolbox open source. Uh, uh, so far, so if, if feel free to check it if you are interested in this uh, line of research. Okay, so lastly, I would like to um, give you some takeaways. So hopefully by now I have to convince you that uh, adversarial robustness is really a new AI standard for trustworthy machine learning system. Because eventually, when we deploy machine learning or AI models to the world, we not only want them to be accurate, but we also don't want them to make mistakes, especially these stupid mistakes. And I would consider these adversarial examples as a very stupid mistakes you know, um, uh, considered by any human being. So how do we, so um, accuracy is, should not be the only goal for AI models. We should also consider adversarial robustness and make sure these AI models don't make these stupid mistakes, uh, no matter it is intentionally, un un unintentionally or maliciously being, uh, uh, being manipulated. Um, and I also want to highlight this is a very interesting area because uh, there's always an un unrace between attackers and defenses. So attackers can use AI to generate more advanced attacks and also defenders can um, also use AI to generate more advanced robust models. And um, we, are, we are very curious about why we will be the equilibrium of these uh, arm races games. And lastly, we also spend some time to discuss how do we formally evaluate and improve model robustness. And what I, dis what I discovered so far is we have a clever, basically uh, attack independent robustness course. And I also tell you um, how we develop crowns and also a CNN cert, basically efficient ways to um, provide robustness certifications. And, and I would argue um, doing this certified robustness or evaluation is better than just coding some random attack functions uh, to test your model because that uh, that uh, game-based uh, evaluation is not certified and you, um, you cannot guarantee your, your defense can be generalized to you know, more advanced attacks. But certification or eva robustness evaluation uh, can actually guarantee this uh, robustness no matter what attacks you are being using. And the other good thing is that you can use this certification or evaluation tools to compare you, your model's robustness before or after you, you implement some mechanisms to, to make it more robust. So eventually, I think the, 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 the next thing that we are going to focus on and also the trend of the whole uh, research community is to, to look into provable, certifiable, and scalable defenses. So as you can imagine, there is uh, a, lot, a lot of fun in this research area. and if you are interested, uh, feel free to contact me or any colleagues within IBM that you know of and join us for this exciting journey. Um, so this is indeed robustness, I believe, is an intersection of a human's perception, AI model, and also uh, the data quality. So this is a very challenging, but also a very salient job that we need to solve. Um, so I want to do a final acknowledgement here. So this, a lot of works, I have uh, many uh, amazing collaborators and many of them I believe are on the phone now, uh, especially my IBM colleagues. And we have uh, these amazing collaborations with, between MIT and IBM and also from uh, AI, AI Horizon Networks. So I would like to thank Lisa, uh, David Cox for making this happen. And also from uh, great support from my management uh, chains like Payot, Payot and also Saska. And also my, a lot of collaborators uh, for people who developed uh, different attacks that we, we didn't really look into, for example, poisoning attack and also developing this other virtual robotic toolbox, like Ian, Matthew and their teams, and also Casey and their teams for making our demo possible. Um, so if you have uh, questions, feel free to reach out to me uh, or find me on the Twitter and that will conclude my presentation. Thank you, Pinya. Thank you very, Thank you. very much. It was a great talk. Um, Let's uh, open up for uh, any questions. Uh, please unmute yourself. If you're not familiar with WebEx, uh, if you move your mouse, you should see a little microphone and then click on it. Uh, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thanks, Ben. You great research. Uh, my question is about certification. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that has been bothering me about certification is the fact that 
you are actually certifying for a particular image rather than yes. for the network itself. Yes. So my question is, do you foresee any way where uh, we can actually get uh, a different perspective that doesn't require you to provide an image? Um, I'm specifically uh, worry about images because uh, potentially before you deploy a model, you don't know exactly um, the distribution of the data that you're going to receive. And so uh, the images may be slightly different. So even though you have a certification for a very particular image, it, the results may not uh, be consistent for more general distributions. So, yes, yes, so yes. we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yes, I, yeah, I, th I think I think this is a very legitimate question. Uh, but I, I guess there are some difficulties to make uh, certification for the model itself at this point because eventually uh, these adversarial inputs are basically operated on a per sample base, right? So, and if you look at the decision boundaries, especially when we are considering certification for uh, adversarial examples, these decision boundaries uh, from a neural network model they are already fixed. So if you so it is basically impossible to provide certificate for any input because there must be some inputs that are very close to the decision boundary. So, uh, but the next interesting question is, uh, can we somehow when we try to gauge the robustness in terms of models or let's say uh, in terms of a per class, can we somehow you know, create some representative uh, samples and such that by guaranteeing the certification on these representative, representative samples, then this robustness can be bringed up to a model level or the class level. I think that would be a very interesting question. But um, at this point, I don't think it is an easy, easy task. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hello, uh, this is Leo Shah from RPI. Uh, right. Thank you so much for the great talk. This is really exciting. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if you could comment on uh, some theoretical problems uh, along this direction. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I guess there are very, very, uh, various theoretical problems that I can think of. For example, um, is, is robustness really at the price of accuracy, right? So empirically, we observe uh, in order to make your model more robust, you always sacrifice test accuracy. But is that necessary, right? Oh, and, if it, if, and if it's true, what is the, uh, what is the theoretical explanation? And what is the limit, right? How, how, how did you categorize this uh, theoretical uh, trade-off, right? And in terms of uh, uh, robustness, uh, uh, robust, robust training, for example, this minimax training, people, it's, it's, always, it's already a challenging task for robust training itself, uh, for itself. Not to mention, we are now we are trying to uh, bring this minimax uh, optimization to the neural network level. So how did you even sure uh, minimax training on, on uh, neural network will converge? And also, is there a scalable way of uh, making this minimax training possible? Um, I think there are various problems, and, and uh, for example, and there are some fundamental problems that we don't know quite sure what are the answers. For example, why do this adversarial example exist? And, and we don't really know. So there are, I think, a lot of open questions, and no, uh, no matter what your expertise and your angle is, you, you, must be, you must be able to find an angle to tackle this problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, so, uh, sorry, just a very uh, follow-up uh, follow from what I comment. Uh, it reminds me of uh, like a, a smooth analysis, yes. like your input may have some noise, and then you are trying to um, build a classifier to fight against it and focus on the kind of the, the mixture it, of worst case uh, slash average yes. case analysis. So yes. that's uh, interesting to look at. Yes, but exactly. Anyway, so uh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a very good point. So this smoothness actually relates to the input Lipschitz function. So if if you think of your your neural as a function, then it's Lipschitz of constant actually regularize how 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 much uh, your input perturbation will amplify the output. So and that's is something that we use to evaluate the robustness. Mm -hmm. That's a very nice uh, observation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're uh, almost at the top of the hour. I don't want to cut off questions, but for those of you that have to leave, I want to remind you that our uh, next seminar is Thursday, May second, at 4 p.m. Eastern time, and it will be by Hugo Chen of RPI on bidirectional attentive memory network for question answering over knowledge bases. Okay, then any other questions for Pinyun? Okay, any other comments? All right, I want to thank everybody then for, uh, for attending. This was a, a really great turnout, even uh, bigger than our, our first. 
and we'll hope to see you all again next week. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, everyone.